Launched to take advantage of a rare grouping of all the big planets on the same side of the Sun, Voyager 1 and 2 left Earth in the summer of 1977. They would head directly for Jupiter, using the planet's immense gravity to accelerate them further out towards Saturn, Uranus and eventually Neptune. The two spacecraft carried humanity's only hope of a close-up look at these outer planets. These were the most complicated spacecraft that had ever been launched. They have three sets of computers which all were interacting with each other. And initially we were struggling to learn how to tell a spacecraft to do things so it would do them in the right way. And in about six months we finally learned how to fly this very complex machine. And we spent the time between Earth and Jupiter getting ready with all the computer programs that the spacecraft is going to need to do all the observations as we flew by Jupiter, because we had just one chance to do it. And so we had to be sure we had planned to use the time very efficiently. Uh, so we were very anxious, of course, when we started our, our far encounter phase, when our we first images of Jupiter came back, and we knew that we were on a mission of discovery. Two years after leaving Earth, and after a journey of half a billion miles, the voyagers were nearing Jupiter. Already we could see Jupiter with unprecedented detail, uh, with winds of hundreds of miles per hour, jet streams, literally dozens of hurricane-like storm systems, many as large as the Earth itself, uh, and the Great Red Spot two or three times the size of the Earth. And then the moons, of course, which look unlike anything that we've seen here on Earth, uh, would just be stunning. During their flybys, the voyagers had snapped fleeting pictures of Jupiter's four big moons. Callisto, Ganymede, Europa, and Io. Although this was our first close encounter with these worlds, no one expected them to be more than frozen, dead places like our moon. Well, almost no one. Back in the 70s, I was just a kid. Uh, fresh out of high school and working at my first job and my boss was a guy who had done a calculation just before the flyby that the moon Io might be volcanic. Active volcanoes erupting on such a tiny moon were thought by most geologists to be impossible but these first pictures from Voyager revealed a strangely fresh surface. They had all the appearance of recent lava flows. We were very puzzled. Of course, when we first saw Io, we didn't know what we were seeing because there were no impact craters. There were all these black blotches, large rings. It was only after the encounter, actually, that it all fell together when we saw a plume several hundred kilometers above the surface that we knew that there was active volcanism on the surface, a hundred times more activity than on Earth, and it had completely covered up all the old craters, and all those black blotches were lakes of liquid lava. When I showed up for my first day at work, they had gotten the data back, and they were so excited. They were right. And uh, to make a prediction that's right is one of the sweetest things that can happen. But the intensity of volcanic activity on this moon took everyone by surprise. At first, volcanologists like John Spencer found it hard to believe what they were seeing. I remember just how amazing and how bizarre these places looked, and particularly seeing one of the pictures of the volcanoes erupting on Io, and first seeing the picture and think, what, what on earth is that? All that can be, there must be a, a meteorite impact on the surface that happened right at the moment that they took the picture in, but I thought, that's crazy. So then I looked at the caption and saw this was actually an erupting volcano, just uh, being totally blown away by that. Quite how such a tiny moon as Io could still be so hot inside remained a puzzle. This was just one reason to head back to Jupiter. And whilst the voyagers carried on to Saturn, a new mission was being readied to return to the giant planet and its clutch of moons. Four, three, two, one. We have ignition and liftoff of Atlantis and the Galileo spacecraft bound for Jupiter. The mission was already running behind schedule when it was launched. Houston now controlling. Roger roll, Atlantis. And as Galileo headed for space, there were more setbacks waiting. When it was finally launched, we rapidly found out that its main antenna was failing to open and it's hard to fix a spacecraft that's millions of miles from Earth. But they were very ingenious, but nothing worked. And for a while we thought, that's the end of it. We can get so little data back that it's hardly going to be worth it. The team 
had already waited over 10 years to get back to Jupiter, and a stuck antenna wasn't going to stop them now. Every day was a challenge to basically keep the spacecraft going, redesign things that didn't quite work anymore. It was almost like having an old car in the garage. Uh, and you got to figure out just how much you could turn the accelerator and put, pump the gas a little bit to get it to go. You knew all the quirks that it needed to uh, continue to perform. And we got to the point where we, were, we knew our machine like an old car. Galileo's weak signal was boosted and data compressions were created to save the mission as it flew towards its difficult date with Jupiter and the radiation belts. Now we've got not just to fly by like the Voyagers, but we've got to go in there. Some of the moons we want are embedded deep inside this, this uh, high energy radiation environment and we want to explore that. Project engineers decided they'd only risk the highest radiation flybys of Io towards the end of the mission. But the views they got proved to be worth the risk. On every flyby of Io, new, fresh eruptions were discovered, where volcanoes had transformed landscapes first photographed by Voyager over ten years before. Io was still awash with active volcanoes. These kind of uh, volcanic eruptions don't happen on Earth anymore. So that Io was very much like the Earth was back in its earliest history. With maybe lava oceans and uh, volcanism that's, that's happening all over the place with a lot of intensity. Um, this is giving us a window into what the early Earth was like. Io is astonishingly volcanically active. Every square foot of Io's surface has 40 times as much heat coming out of it as an equivalent area on the Earth. And in fact, one of Io's volcanoes, the volcano Loki, the most powerful volcano on Io, just that one volcano is putting out almost as much heat as the entire planet Earth. Such huge amounts of heat defied physics. Io should have cooled down long ago. Something was still generating heat inside this tiny moon. The power of Jupiter's gravity is pulling the surface up and down maybe by 100 meters every day. And in fact, it's this continual distortion of Io that is heating the interior and producing this frenetic volcanic activity. But even Jupiter's immense gravitational pull couldn't account for all this heat. And closer scrutiny of data from Galileo might yet help to explain where all this energy is coming from. But perhaps planetary geologists won't know for sure why Io is so active until a mission lands on its surface. Switching to manual. This is one grumpy piece of rock. Even the gravity's uneven. Flying over the surface of Io would be an amazing sight. The surface is so varied. There are these vast, featureless plains. You would have huge mountains coming up over the horizon, very rugged mountains, some of them twice as high as Everest. You'd have these plumes that you could see on the skyline, blasting material hundreds of miles into the air. You'd see the glow of red hot or white hot lava on the surface below you. You see these huge volcanic craters. It would just be an amazing sight. Nothing has ever landed on Io. No robots and certainly no humans. But thanks to the Voyagers and the Galileo spacecraft's flybys of the little moon, Mission scientists have a pretty good idea what the colors and landscapes would look like from the surface. It's a spectrum of browns, ochres, and deep, deep reds. Appear to be allotropes of sulfur. These are primitive lava flows, all right. It's a throwback to Earth's early history. I'm standing on a silicate crust. It's covering the sulfur in places, but it's weak. My feet are breaking through. As the surface is, is being distorted by Jupiter, I'm sure it's going to be creaking and groaning all the time with, with this enormous distortion and you get incredible seismic activity. <sighs> We'd see these huge plumes of dust and gas being blasted off into space. Um, it just would be an incredible place. The views might be spectacular on Io, but it's the things you can't see that would pose the most danger for an astronaut on the surface. Rads have picked up. Look at that interference. Scrub the EVA. 
We're picking up increased radiation readings and we need you to return to Hermes right now. Your spacesuit offers you very little protection in, in intense radiation fields and uh, somewhere like the surface of Io is just lethal to you just from the radiation fields that you would experience. Uh, and radiation causes problems because it, it damages the, your DNA, the blueprint for, for the rest of your body, can cause mutations, can lead to cancers. You're doing a great job, Zoe. That suit is a disaster. It's too heavy. It's too much radiation getting through. If you don't protect yourself, you're going to run into problems very quickly. I'm not clear how we can get around that, possibly by active shielding. Until such a technology becomes a reality, future exploration of Jupiter and its moons will be done with robots. <laughs>